I, I want to give you kind of an uh, introduction to the, the, the first principles numerical modeling techniques that, um, that, well, I think are the most promising in order to understand optoelectronic properties of materials in general um, and halide perovskites in, in particular. And what this is going to be primarily about is uh, an introduction to density functional theory. Um, so what you're going to see here um, are some basics, like really a kind of um, undergrad level basics of, of many body quantum mechanics, just so that everyone is on, on the same page and as a reminder of what's going to be uh, important when we basically uh, look at density functional theory, which is, of course, a, a method to solve the um, interacting many body quantum mechanical problem. Um, and what I'm aiming to do here is, is kind of to, to uh, give you an insight into what Thomas mentioned in his introduction when, when he said, well, you know, a lot of things can go wrong when you use DFT. You could use the wrong functional um, uh, or there are many other things that, that, get, that could somehow go wrong. So I want to hopefully try to explain uh, what these things are that could go wrong, why they can go wrong, and what we can do about it. Um, you will also see some band structures of halide perovskites uh, calculated from first principles and some examples of, of what I just mentioned. Um, and I want to talk particularly about the, the particular pitfalls of halide perovskites when it comes to calculating band structures, because they are a little bit more complicated than, than other uh, semiconductors are. And finally, uh, if I still have time, uh, a primer on excited state calculations, um, where we go kind of beyond density functional theory. Um, and use Green's functions in order to, to calculate, for example, absorption spectra. Um, so let's get started um, with the very basics, which is, OK, we want to somehow describe a, a system of n particles. And these particles, um, since you're interested in, in, in condensed matter, are uh, basically electrons and, and nuclei. and on that level, what distinguishes a solid from an atom, a molecule, or, or a cluster is really just um, the, the number of, of particles that we, are, that we are dealing with, right? So um, the only assumption that we are making at this point is that we have these electrons and nuclei, which are interacting via Coulomb interactions. And we, we know from, from quantum mechanics that um, that electrons are, are fermions, and um, that means that we have to basically write their wave function in a specific way um, that leads to the phenomenon of, phenomenon of Pauli exclusion. So that's also kind of a, an interaction that, that, uh, that is present and that is correctly taken and has to be correctly taken into account in when we write down these equations. We also assume for now that relativistic effects are negligible when we write down all of these equations. It's, it's relatively straightforward to include this in practical density functional theory calculations. Um, and when I show you these band structures later, um, spin orbit coupling will always be included in these calculations. But for the sake of, of you know, deriving the equations and, and, and somehow showing you what's important, we don't really need to deal with uh, spinners and, and stuff like this for now. So we are just assuming that we have um, a certain number of nuclei um, and, and electrons. And then we can write down the, the Hamilton operator of that system, which basically consists of um, the kinetic energy of the nuclei, uh, which you see here. So we're basically just summing up all, summing up all these, um, these contributions of each and every nucleus in the system. Um, then the Coulomb interaction between those nuclei. And then we have the sum over all the kinetic energy of uh, the electrons, their Coulomb and interaction with each other, and then their Coulomb interaction with the nuclei. So that's that's the whole thing. And um, we shortened this a little bit. Then one could write this as basically the sum of kinetic energy of, of the nuclei. And I apologize for the, for the naming here. This is still from a lecture that I gave in Germany. So this is the K is for, for the German word for, for the nuclei. Um, I just was too lazy to retype the equations. Um, the, the interaction of the nuclei with each other and then the electronic Hamiltonian, which is basically the second line here. Um, and so to solve this, 
in principle, the only thing that we would need to do would be to solve the Schrodinger equation for, for this stationary state. So let's let's assume we are not interested in, in dynamical effects, time dependence. So we really just want to solve the stationary Schrodinger equation, uh, which looks looks like this. And now the, the important thing is basically that this wave function here depends on all the positions of all the nuclei and the positions of all the electrons. So it's a highly complicated, high dimensional object. And in, in general, this uh, equation is impossible to solve for more than just a couple of, of electrons and nuclei um, because it's just too, too complex. So we need to make approximations, um, that's for sure. Uh, the question is basically, which approximations are important and uh, are gonna basically distort the physical pictures and which ones are harmless. The one that is considered pretty harmless for, for a lot of the things that I'm gonna show you today um, is the von Oppenheimer approximation, um, which I'm assuming that most of you have, have heard about this, but again, just so that everyone um, is on the same page. Von Oppenheimer approximation basically means that we are assuming that because the the nuclei are much more heavy than the electrons. Um, the electrons will always instantaneously follow the, the, the motion of, of the nuclei. And that means that we can basically separate, decouple the, um, uh, the, the, the Schrodinger equations of the nuclei and the electrons. Mathematically, we do that by factorizing the total wave function. And so we basically write it as uh, the sum over the product of um, this, this wave function that only depends on the positions of the nuclei and the electronic wave function, which I call psi in the following, which depends on both sets of, of, um, of coordinates. But now the difference is that these uh, nuclear positions are basically only parameters in this equation uh, or in this wave function. They are not variables, they are parameters now. So that allows me to separate uh, the, the equations for, for these two wave functions. So I first get a wave function, a Schrodinger equation for the electronic problem. Um, again, where the, the nuclear positions, they are in there because of course the position of the nuclei determines kind of the potential that uh, the electrons are feeling, but they're only parameters. So we assume them to be static in this, in this equation. Um, and then we solve this, we get, uh, we get energies and, and, and wave functions from this, um, and then we can plug those into our nuclear equation and can solve that separately. Um, okay, so um, let's, let's assume we, we have basically done that. We, that means that though we still have uh, two different quantum mechanical Schrodinger equations, um, so we are still treating the nuclei as quantum mechanical particles. And um, the, the next approximation that is almost always made in, in, in practice, uh, in, in applications basically, is that we are also assuming that the nuclei are actually classical. So we are not even solving this Schrodinger equation for the nuclei anymore. We are just assuming they are basically classical um, uh, charged particles that just provide uh, a, a potential that the electrons are feeling. Uh, and so the only thing that we are left to solve with is uh, this electronic uh, Schrodinger equation that you see here. So basically a sum over the kinetic energies of the electrons, then the external potential, which depends on the position of the nuclei, the Coulomb interaction between the electrons. And then uh, what we get from that is the electronic wave function, which depends on the positions of the, the nuclei. And indirectly, it, it depends on, on where the, uh, sorry, did I say nuclear? Yeah, the positions of the electrons and indirectly it also depends on, on the positions of the nuclear, of course, through this para parameter dependence of the potential. So, okay, fair enough. Now we have already uh, simplified the problem um, to a great amount, but still this, this psi here, this electronic wave function is still a highly correlated, uh, high, highly dimen high dimensional wave function of the n electron system. And um, you probably know from your quantum mechanic lectures that, that an exact solution for this is only possible if there are very few electrons. And um, this, this problem can maybe be made a bit more, um, you know, um, uh, obvious 
uh, by something that is called the exponential wall of many body quantum mechanics. And, and that is basically, if you think about this problem, not in terms of how complicated it is to solve uh, this equation, but how difficult would it actually be to store the solution of it? So think about an atom, a simple atom like neon, which has 10 electrons, and assume we have actually solved exactly the, or uh, approximately the, the Schrodinger equation of this, uh, of this system, we get a wave function. And we want to store that wave function on a grid. So on a, on a grid in real space, we basically have, uh, let's assume we have 10 grid points per axis, which is actually quite coarse. That wouldn't basically give us a lot of detail. So this is the, the grid plotted here in two dimensions. In truth, we have, we have of course, three dimensions in which we would have to store it. So that means you would have 10 to the three grid points on which we have to store the wave function. And the wave function depends on, um, on the positions of these, 10, um, of these 10 electrons. So I have actually n grid points, which is 10 to the three, to the power of n numbers that I need to store. So that's 10 to the 30 numbers that I need to store. And that's a very, very large number. If you uh, kind of translate this into, uh, into, I always like to translate it into USB sticks, although this estimate is actually a couple of years old. So probably numbers have changed a little bit. Um, then it would basically correspond to three times 10 to the 19 USB sticks of uh, 32 gigabytes that you would need, which would weigh roughly 10 to the 14 tons. So it's, uh, it's very heavy. Uh, SpaceX lifts 64 tons. Um, this is a very silly comparison, but I hope you get the point. Even this extremely simple system that only very few people are probably interested in how exactly the electronic stru structure looks like uh, is basically impossible um, to solve. Uh, like like this in this brute force way. Okay, so we need to do smart things to to actually uh, solve the problem. And at the foundation of uh, of uh, these, uh, basically all the smart ways of, of solving this problem is the so-called variational principle. Um, the variational principle says that uh, we can write the, the ground state total energy of our n particle system as an expectation value uh, with the ground state wave function. Let's assume we know that. Then if we basically calculate this, um, then we get the, the ground state energy. And um, OK, so the Hamiltonian here is our uh, electronic many particle uh, Hamiltonian. And we know that basically the variational principle tells us that any other the wave function that I put in here uh, basically gives us an upper bound to the ground state energy. So anything else that I put in here, any trial wave function will give an energy that is either higher or the same as the ground state energy. And if it's the same, then I know that this is the ground state wave function. So in principle, that means, and this is very useful, that by minimizing uh, the energy, I can find the ground state. And mathematically, this would be written um, uh, like this. So I minimize this energy, which is a functional of the wave function. And I will get back to what a functional is and, and why, uh, why this concept is important. Um, uh, for, for a certain particle number, I get uh, the ground state energy. And the question now is basically, how do I actually choose this trial wave function? How do I know what to actually put in here? And that's basically where a lot of the different quantum mechanical or quantum chem chemical methods that are around differ. So, for example, the simplest one that is more interesting for um, pedagogical uh, purposes would be the Hartree Fock method. In that case, we are choosing a trial wave function um, that is basically uh, a Slater determinant. A Slater determinant is basically just that I'm assuming I have um, orbitals uh, or one particle states that uh, come from basically a non-interacting system and uh, without Coulomb interactions. And I, I basically uh, write the simplest correctly anti-symmetrized product wave function of, of these uh, one particle orbitals. That would be a Slater determinant. And if I take that and then minimize the energy, I get the Hartree-Fock equations, um, uh, which are one way to solve this problem but um, not a very accurate one. So for practical purposes, Hartree fock is, is not accurate enough. It basically doesn't give very accurate um, um, uh, uh, total energies. Um, 
And uh, what is what is more important than is uh, our methods that basically rely on linear combinations of selected determinants because it's basically shown that the exact wave function has to be a linear com or can be written as a linear combination of, of selected determinants. So there is like a whole hierarchy of, of uh, methods that depend on uh, this concept, but these are very, very complicated and very, very computationally demanding. And uh, on that same uh, level is, uh, is also quantum Monte Carlo, which is also relying on the variational principle and is also a method that is incredibly useful, gives incredibly accurate um, results, but is also very, very computationally heavy. Um, and density functional theory um, is basically um, a completely different approach to this problem. So what we are doing in density functional theory is we are completely throwing overboard the concept of the many particle wave function. And we're replacing it with the density, the electron density as the central variable. And um, that works because at the heart of density functional theory is a, is a theorem by uh, Hohenberg and Cohn that tells us that all the information that is contained in that wave function, which I showed you is a lot of information because it requires a lot of effort to store it, is actually also contained in density in a certain way. I'm gonna explain what that means, but they do contain the same density. And if that doesn't blow your mind, um, then I don't know what, because it, this is really um, um, kind of incredible that this works, but it is, something that can be exactly shown and that is exactly true without any approximations other than the ones that I, that I mentioned that are not really relevant for this, for this sort of um, statement. And this is uh, the contribution mostly of Walter Cohn, who got uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for it in 1998, um, because it was such an important uh, um, finding, basically, and revolutionized the way that, that computations uh, uh, have been done in the, in the past uh, decades and have really made it a practical tool, a workhorse that, that almost anyone can, can use who has uh, a working computer. Um, if, you are, if you get really excited um, by, by all of this and you're theory-minded, then I can very much um, recommend this paper to you or this review article um, by Klaus Capelle, uh, which is called The Bird's Eye View of, of DFT, which is really Really nice kind of beginners to intermediate level introduction to the most important concepts of, of DFT. And uh, what I can also recommend is uh, this nature um, piece. It's, it's unfortunately obituary um, that was written by Lou Sham about Walter Cohn when he died in 2016, because Walter Cohn is also just a really, really fascinating uh, figure and, and, and person uh, with, a, um, with, a, with a very inspiring history. And so if you're interested in him as well, then um, I do read up on him. It's, it's very interesting. Um, but back to the density. So how is the density actually connected to the wave function? That maybe is the first question that we should answer. Um, we get the density by basically integrating over the um, well, the, the, the product of uh, the, the wave function. So this is the electronic wave function again, um, complex conjugate times the, times the wave function um, and integrating over all spatial coordinates. Uh, so all the positions of the electrons apart from one and that multiplied by the particle number that gives us the density. So there is basically a a, a, a functional form that leads us from um, knowing the wave function to knowing the density. And um, just to kind of bring back this point, how amazing it actually is that these two quantities contain the same information. Think about that this wave function is actually a three n dimensional um, uh, quantity, whereas the, the density itself has only three dimensions, three spatial dimensions and still somehow they contain the same information. That's pretty incredible. The reason that is, is that um, the wave function is basically a, a so-called functional of the density. So that means um, we write that mathematically by these kind of brackets here. Um, whenever you see something like this, it basically means that um, wave function is a functional of the density, a functional 
is basically a recipe for get, going from a function to a number, very, very uh, uh, broadly speaking, in the same way as a function is a recipe from, but for going from a number to a number. Um, and an example for this, uh, for, for functional would be uh, the, would be the particle number. The particle number, number of electrons in your system is a functional of the density because what I need to do in order to get um, the, the particle number is I need to basically integrate my, my electronic density over the entire space and it should give me the particle number. And that's why that's what is called a functional. Another example would be the, the heart rate potential, which you should know from um, electrodynamics, um, which is also a functional of the density. Um, uh, and you get it by, by integrating over um, the density divided by um, the distance um, of the electron to a point. So um, that's also a functional and can be written in this way. <clears throat> So the Hohenberg cone theorem, to put this now um, in, in a little bit more um, mathematical terms, uh, basically tells us that if we have the ground state density of a system, so the system is in its ground state, we know its density and it's called N0, it is in principle possible to calculate the corresponding wave function. And that means that all other ground state observables um, must be functionals of this ground state density as well. Because if we know the, the ground state wave function, of course, we can always calculate any other observable. Um, and so um, by, by, knowing, by knowing the connection between the density and the wave function, we also get any other observable. So, so in a way, in this particular way, the um, ground state density basically implies knowledge of all possible ground state observables. The only practical problem is that we don't always know how to basically write uh, any ground state observable um, as a functional of the density. Okay, so that's the hohenberg cone theorem. And this is possible. The reason that this works is because um, the wave function is not just an arbitrary function because uh, but the wave function is basically a function that because of the variational principle also must minimize um, the energy. So if we have any given ground state, we can basically write this uh, requirement like this. So this ground state energy is zero for some potential V, which is basically given by the arrangement of nuclei that we, that we are interested in, uh, is, is given by minimizing um, this, um, this quantity here, which is basically, um, I'm, this is just a Hamilton operator. I'm now basically have already split this up. You will see later why this is important. This is sum of kinetic energy, which we always call T, and then uh, the, the interaction between the electrons, which we call U, and uh, the external potential, which we call V. Um, and um, this is basically the minimization with respect to the wave, uh, the wave function that corresponds to the ground state density. That gives us the ground state energy. Um, okay, for any other arbitrary density, um, we can basically define um, a functional of the, of the density um, that uh, we write like this. And we know basically because of the um, of the um, uh, of the variational principle that for any density that is different from the ground state density, um, the, the the wave function that produces this density must be different from the ground state wave function, and so the energy here must be larger or equal to uh, to the uh, to the ground state energy. So in practical terms, the, this, this functional E is minimized by the ground state density and its value at the minimum is the, the ground state energy. That's basically what the hohenberg cone theorem tells you. And this is, um, this is really the heart of density functional theory, but that's not necessarily what made density functional theory the, the kind of um, practical tool that it is nowadays. So what makes DFT practical is another idea by uh, by Cohn and his postdoc Sham, 
um, to basically rewrite this energy functional, so basically this quantity here, in a smart way that basically breaks it down into pieces that we already know how they look like, and then a part that we don't know, but that we um, that is easy to approximate in a way. Um, so what is being done is basically to split up all of these terms into, um, into terms that basically correspond to non-interacting uh, energies and interacting energies. And non-interacting always means that I basically just imagine a system of N electrons uh, which don't feel any Coulomb interaction with each other. So I split up this kinetic energy into a non-interacting kinetic energy uh, and, a, and, and, uh, and basically the rest, which would be the total one minus the non-interacting one. And then I do the same with the electron-electron interaction in the way that I split it up into a Hartree term. So that's basically corresponding to the electro, like that classical electrostatic Hartree interaction and everything that is uh, in the difference between the total electron-electron interaction and Hartree plus my external potential, which I cannot split up because that always will depend on the system that, I, that I'm in. So that is actually the part that is different for each system. So these two differences here, the T minus T non-interacting and the U minus U hard tree are basically put together into one energy term, which is called the exchange correlation energy or exchange correlation functional. So that is the one that Thomas was talking about earlier, where things can go wrong. And we will talk about this in a moment. Um, the non-interacting kinetic energy, I'm calling for short now TS, um, which stands for single particle, just so that I don't have to write non-interacting all the time. Um, this is actually not directly a functional of, of the density, but it is a functional of the um, single particle orbitals or non-interacting orbitals, which are themselves a functional of density. So that's why it's written in this funny way, but that's not really important for understanding what comes next. So what is important is, okay, we write now this energy functional in this way, where we have split it up into this non-interacting kinetic energy, the Hartree term, the exchange correlation potential and the external potential. And now we basically can minimize it. Minimizing means we need to basically vary it with respect to the density. And this term here is what's called um, a functional derivative. So they are just basically mathematical rules to how to do this, just as there are rules for building um, the derivative of, uh, of a function with respect to, uh, to a parameter. So we basically um, write this for each of these terms and um, then it basically can just be written as um, a sum of the functional derivative of this kinetic energy with respect to the density, um, then the function derivative of the um, external potential with respect to density is just um, uh, the external potential, sorry, the, the energy that is related to this potential, the, then the Hartree uh, potential, and then what's called the exchange correlation potential. So we don't know how this looks like uh, right now, we basically just define it as the functional derivative of this energy term. We can do the same thing now um, for a non-interacting system. So a system of N electrons that don't feel any Coulomb interactions between each other. So we can write the same equation for that one. We want to minimize the same energy functional, um, but now we, we only have basically the kinetic energy um, and um, the, the external uh, potential energy term of this, um, of, of this non-interacting system. So that looks like this. And the trick now is basically to realize that um, both of these minimizations have the same solution, the same solution in terms of the density. If I define this potential as the sum of the external potential, the Hartree potential, and this exchange correlation potential. So one can calculate the density of the interacting many body system in this potential VR by basically solving equations of a non-interacting single body system in this potential VS of R. So you're basically just kind of 
um, making up an effective potential that our interacting electrons um, are in, in which they basically appear as if they are non-interacting. And that specifically corresponds to solving a set of Schrodinger-like equations in which these um, so-called cone sham eigenstates phi i now appear to be basically living in this um, effective potential, which is basically defined as the sum of the external potential, the Hartree potential, and the exchange correlation potential. And then we get the density um, of this system by basically solving uh, these Schrodinger, this, this set of Schrodinger equations and <clears throat> getting these eigenstates and then summing over these eigenstates. Um, that gives me basically the, the density. And this set of equations is known as the Cohn-Sham equations. And that's basically what we are doing in practical calculations. We solve this set of equations. Maybe um, if you're already a bit familiar with that, you will notice that um, this is, is uh, something that needs to be solved self-consistently because um, uh, uh, we basically need to first make a, a guess for, uh, for this density. Um, which we then need to use to calculate um, the Hartree potential and the exchange correlation potential um, and the, the external potential and, um, and uh, then use this to solve uh, this equation here. And then that gives us the set of uh, phi i's, which we can then use to get the density again. And then um, this goes, uh, is, is iterated until it, it uh, reaches self-consistent. Uh, self-consistency. So in practice, this is really what is done in, in, in calculations. So the problem is, of course, um, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, that we don't know this exchange correlation energy. Um, we don't have any functional form for this, and we also don't, we, we don't know how it should look like. It needs to be approximated. And this is basically where um, a lot of people get very frustrated with DFT, and maybe you have seen a picture like this before. Um, which basically shows all the different uh, approximations of this functional that are around. And there are many more than, than you see here. And it basically just seems like a black box where people kind of pick, uh, pick something uh, according to some criteria that no one really understands. Um, there are even like these funny polls, uh, DFT popularity poll, for example, that Marcel Swart is uh, has, has basically been doing since 2010, where you can vote for your favorite functional and stuff like this. And don't ask me which is the most popular one. I haven't even checked it. It's, um, yeah, it's 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 um, it's a funny thing. Um, but um, it it in my opinion, it only seems uh, extremely arbitrary. If if you know a little bit more about it, then um, it's it's less of a black box, and that's really my goal today that if you take away anything from this, it should be, first of all, the DFT is in principle an exact theory that is incredibly um, uh, fascinating. And secondly, that the approximations that are being made are actually physically motivated and, um, and, uh, can, and that we understand very well, at least to some extent, what they're doing. So um, how, just to show you uh, some approximations that are commonly used in the literature and how those are being motivated. So usually what is being done is that this exchange correlation energy is split up into an exchange and a correlation part um, like this. And um, the simplest approximation that is around and it's kind of also historically, um, the first one is so-called local density approximation, which basically um, relies on um, the fact that the uh, exchange energy of a homogeneous electron gas is exactly known. So in the uh, LDA, we are basically assuming that um, the density of our system at each point is equal to the density of a homogeneous electron gas. So the expression for this looks like this. It has a relatively simple functional form. As you see here, it has this dependence of the integral of, of the density to the power of four over three. Um, the more complicated part in this case is the correlation uh, energy because that's not known exactly, but there are very, very accurate quantum Monte Carlo uh, calculations of the correlation contribution of the homogeneous electron gas. And basically all the um, exchange correlation functional approximations that are around today rely on parameterizations of, of these calculations. 
and in, surprisingly maybe and interestingly um, this extremely simple approximation is incredibly accurate um, uh, already for a wide range of, of different systems uh, particularly solids and that's um, partly because by construction density functional theory already has a large part of anything that's important for the total energy basically taken care of by uh, by the parts of the energy that we know explicitly. And secondly, that is because of a systematic error cancellation between this exchange and this correlation part that leads to pretty good results. Um, so this works pretty well, but it's nowhere near chemical accuracy. So there would be uh, energies uh, of an accuracy of one uh, kilocalorie per mole. So it's nowhere near that. Um, to get closer to that, uh, it kind of is maybe intuitively clear that we need to include some sort of information of how the uh, density varies spatially. So in the in local density approximation, we don't have that information at all. We only have information about density at one point, but we want to include um, something about um, the spatial variation that's done in the form of gradients of the density and those functionals that um, have this, this information are called semi-local functionals or, or GGAs, generalized gradient approximations that stands for. So they always basically have a form, um, a functional form that is dependent on the density and then gradients of the density. Um, I'm not gonna go into any other details because there are uh, really a lot of different ways to, to approximate this. Um, some of these are basically based on um, fitting these functional forms to a large set of parameters, um, but um, those are typically also just restricted to the parameter sets or the, 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 the set of um, um, yeah, systems that were used for fitting, um, whereas there are other very successful approximations that are basically based on a so-called exact constraints. So these are basically um, exact mathematical characteristics of, of the exchange correlation functional that we know exist. And so um, these functionals fulfill these, these limitations. And um, that's why they're also much more versatile and work for many different systems. The PBE, for example, would be a very famous um, functional like this. And this comes much closer to chemical accuracy. And also it describes well all forms of different chemical bonds uh, in solids and molecules and clusters, uh, with the exception maybe uh, of um, long range van der Waals interactions, which are not really captured by these sorts of, of, of functionals, but there are basically other ways for taking these into account uh, that I don't want to go into details. The upshot um, of, of all of this is that um, DFT is a ground state theory, um, and that's really important for what comes next. So um, for, for everything that you want to calculate that somehow depends on, on knowledge of the potential energy surface, the total energy, the binding energies, formation energies, um, structures, stuff like this, um, DFT is, is very good and can be extremely accurate. Um, there is also uh, an exact generalization for time-dependent problems, which is called TDDFT, which I'm not going to talk about at all because it's not very relevant for solids, but more for molecules. Um, for reasons that would go too far to explain right now. Um, but the question that arises here, if DFT is a ground state theory, then what can it tell us about electronic states? And the traditional view about this is not really anything at all because these eigenvalues and eigenstates that we get from the cone sham equations, they are actually just mathematical auxiliary quantities, right? They basically just come out of this kind of, um, mathematical construction that we made uh, in order for deriving this and in order to get the density, but they have no meaning. But this is wrong. And this has been shown time and again, first of all, empirically. Um, I mean, you, you probably have seen a lot of band structures in the literature of, of halide perovskites, for example, and they, 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 they look pretty, uh, pretty decent. And, and if you compared them to, to experiment, uh, they would have systematic deviations from experiment, but they would look quite similar. So they're definitely more than just uh, auxiliary quantities, but their, their meaning has also be, been defined basically um, in, in, in a lot of work um, as uh, that has been done in, in the community. Um, I'm gonna skip this here a little bit because 
I'm kind of running out of time. Um, one thing that I should mention that is that there is a, a theorem uh, in density functional theory that relates the energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital exactly to the negative of the ionization potential. So if you had the exact um, uh, functional or a very, very accurate density uh, to calculate uh, your, your, uh, your cone sham eigenvalues from, then this would basically hold exactly. Um, but it also turns out that these Koncham eigenvalues are actually pretty good approximations to uh, relaxed electron removal energies. Relaxed meaning that I remove an electron from the system and the system then can react to this relaxation. Um, and this is basically what uh, we would measure in a, in a photo emission experiment. So um, when we sh and shine light on the system and we basically take an electron out uh, in a way, so this corresponds to a charged um, a, a charged uh, excitation of the system where an electron is removed, um, this would be uh, generally, at least for the highest occupied uh, eigenstates, relatively well described by, uh, by, by cone sham eigenvalues. Um, we can also get um, something like the ionization potential of a system from total energies, though, which is what this um, idea of removing an electron is supposed to show you. So um, you can always calculate the ionization potential of a system by basically calculating total energy of your system and then removing an electron from the system and then calculating the total energy of that system. And that would also give you the, the ionization potential. Uh, similarly, um, we can relate electron addition energies to an inverse photo emission experiment, so where we are adding an electron to the system. And based on that, this, one can define um, an, a band gap, um, fundamental or band gap or electron removal addition band gap as the difference between the ionization potential and the electron affinity. You can write this based on what I've just said as um, a, a difference of total energies. But the important thing about Koncham DFT is, and it's another take home message maybe, is that this fundamental band gap is unequal to the Koncham gap, and that's by construction. So that's basically really um, an exact property of Koncham DFT. It's not a bug or something, or has, it has nothing to do with the fact that we are making approximations. It's really just um, um, a feature of the exact theory. And that's because there is this ionization potential theorem which connects the ionization potential to the homo eigenvalue, but there is no such theorem for the electron affinity. Um, and another way of saying that or seeing this is that in the Koncham equations, all of these Koncham eigenstates basically feel the same potential here. Um, whereas in reality, they should actually feel different ones. Um, and so the actual equation that we would need to solve in order to really get the, get the exact band gap and the exact correspondence to a photo emission or inverse photo emission experiment would be to solve this so-called Dyson equation where we replace this exchange correlation potential, which is local. So it looks the same for all, the, for all these Goncham states. We replace it by a non-local and energy dependent operator, which is known as the so-called irreducible self-energy. I'm going to skip here a little bit because I'm really running out of time and not going to show you this so that we at least talk a little bit about the perovskites. So now let me just say one thing about it. So one uh, specific way of, of um, basically um, approximating this ir irreducible self-energy is the so-called GW approach, um, which is something that is um, has been used in more in the solid state physics community since the 60s for calculating band structures of solids. Um, whereas the DFT is always, has always been more located in the chemistry community. Um, and um, basically this is a very successful theory. So um, here you see basically band gaps in blue calculated with this GW approach for a range of different semiconductors. And you see that they um, are in very good agreement with the experiment for, for a wide range of systems. It just turns out when we kind of do the same thing for, uh, for the halide perovskites, uh, which, which I did a couple of years ago for this set of halide perovskites here, then 
well, this is basically the plot, then uh, we get a very mixed picture. So again, th these blue points here are the GW results, which as I showed you are very accurate for a lot of different semiconductors, but for the halide perovskite, they work for some, uh, this approach works for some of them, but for others, it underestimates the band gaps pretty heavily. And one of these problematic systems is actually MAPI. Um, so we need to do more um, uh, sophisticated stuff. So a lot of acronyms are coming in here, which I'm not gonna explain to get better agreement. And it's clear why this happens, but what we are lacking right now is kind of a one size fits all approach or some kind of smart approach of, of basically choosing uh, our methodology uh, before we know the experimental results. So what is lacking at the moment in these electronic structure methods is a certain amount of predictive power, I would say. Um, and here's just a particularly striking example of um, what, how wrong DFT can, can get um, if you aren't careful. Um, so this is the band structure of a double perovskite uh, that's called cesium-2 silver thallium bromide-6, so not necessarily something that is relevant for applications, but it's a very interesting system because it has a very, very small band gap for bromide-based perovskite. And if you calculate naively uh, the, the, the band structure of this, this with, with uh, DFT, uh, what you get is this picture here where you kind of see there's, there are these crossings here at the Fermi level, and it almost looks like a, like a Dirac semi-metal, so something very exotic and uh, topologically non-trivial. And so when I calculated this, I got very, very excited uh, until I realized um, by basically talking to my experimental collaborators that something must go really, really wrong here with my DFT calculations. And indeed, it turns out DFT can underestimate band gaps so heavily that the conduction band minimum is basically pushed below uh, the valence band maximum. And you have to really go beyond standard methods in order to open that band gap and, and kind of see what the experiments are seeing. So that's what I mean by we, we kind of lack predictive power at this point. Other perovskite specific pitfalls, I would say are that, um, as you know, these materials have very, very rich phase diagrams. So in, 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 as a function of temperature, they go through a lot of structural transitions, um, but most of our calculations are actually carried out at zero Kelvin. So we, we are not really taking temperature into account properly in a lot of calculations. And this is particularly problematic for the hybrid perovskites because here with the organic molecule, we have a complicated additional degree of freedom that um, heavily uh, affect the structure of the system and also in return the, the band structure. Um, so this, for example, is the, the cubic high symmetry um, structure of methyl ammonium lead iodide. And in that cubic primitive unit cell, I'm seeing Thomas, I should, I should speed up, but I'm almost done. I'm going to skip the excitons. Um, so in this cubic unit cell, we are basically, um, we just have one methyl ammonium molecule per unit cell. And so whatever orientation we choose for this molecule, I've chosen it like pointing directly into Z direction here, but any direction that I choose is gonna be periodically repeated if, because in my calculation, I'm assuming periodic boundary conditions. And that means that uh, by construction, I'm creating a system that has a, macroscopic polarization because of the dipole moment of the methyl ammonium molecule. And if I then do what would be for other materials a completely normal procedure, namely a geometry optimization of my experimental crystal structure, then I will introduce large distortions that depend on how exactly this molecule is basically arranged. So you can see that maybe here a little bit that this lead atom is kind of off-centering a bit and these distortions, these off-centerings and also tilts of the octahedra that you see in, 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 can see in these calculations, those lead to really, really large changes in the band structure. They open the band gap um, and they lead to the so-called Rashba's effect, uh, the splitting of the energy bands uh, due to spin orbit coupling. And um, this is a spurious effect that is greatly exaggerated uh, if you are not mindful about how you choose your structural models. Um, and so there, we have looked into how the magnitude of, of this Rashba effect uh, depends on, on the macroscopic polarization of these systems. 
And there's also a really nice paper by uh, Frona et al, where they've been combining uh, calculations with um, with experiment in order to, to learn something about the kind of um, base group of, of the room temperature structure of MAPI. So this is something to be really mindful of, um, the structural model that you choose. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to go to the end. Um, we can also go beyond ground state calculations and calculate excitons, um, which is a really nice story, but I want to have enough time for your questions. So.